Need for Speed 2. The title alone still manages to stir a sense of elation somewhere deep within my skull, firing up the same dusty synapses as my 11-year-old self in 1997. Back then, I'd only picked up the Need for Speed SE half a year earlier, but that was an irrefutable eternity in kid time. So, seeing my favorite game already had a sequel really psyched me up. And as much as I loved NFS SE's selection of sports cars and exotics, Need for Speed 2 took it all to the next level. Need for Speed 2 had supercars, signified by the Rasa Corsa Red Ferrari F50 on the cover. Compared to NFS 1's relatively obtainable lineup from the likes of Toyota, Dodge, and Porsche, it was exciting that I had practically zero chance of seeing NFS 2's cars on the road. With the exception of the Lotus Esprit, these were truly exotic vehicles meant only for the richest of the rich. It even had concept cars, something super appealing to a kid obsessed with downloading 256 color images of show cars on America Online. I still have some of those, by the way. <laughs> Check out that low-res dithering. And that Ford GT90. Yeah, if there was one big reason I wanted Need for Speed 2 so badly, it was the inclusion of the most thrilling concept vehicle I'd ever seen. I thought the GT90 was just about the coolest car in existence, after the Dodge Viper, of course. There was something otherworldly about its GT40 crossed with a spaceship design, and its nonsensical 48-valve 720-horsepower V12. I wore out the GT90 issue of Car and Driver, I had the first edition's Hot Wheels car, I built the Snapfast model kit, and there was this one store at the mall that carried these fantastic 118 scale replicas that I always drooled over for their size and attention to detail. In particular, I thought this one was just the most awesome thing, a Ford GT90 in gloss black. This was complete fiction, of course. The real GT90 was a one-off concept car, painted white, but I didn't care. The appeal was the fictionalization. The fantasy of driving a hyper-exotic car in a custom paint job, a fantasy Need for Speed 2 promised to fulfill. The black GT90 could be mine in-game, and my preteen hype level increased exponentially any time I saw it on a store shelf. Once we saved up the cash, my best friend and I went halvesies on it in the summer of 1998 and purchased the CD-ROM Classics Edition from the local software, etc. And as soon as we got home and got it installed, eh, much as I'd like to say we were blown away, the truth is we were more confused. The game's performance was unexpectedly sluggish on my 233MHz Acer Aspire PC, the driving felt oddly stiff with lots of understeer, and the police chases we enjoyed so much in NFS 1 were completely gone. And dang it, where was the color black? I was elated you could change the car colors now, but the fact that they didn't include black was baffling. There were even black painted cars on the box. All pictures of real ones, but still, I felt deceived. And for perhaps the first time, I felt a tinge of buyer's remorse. I'd hyped myself up over a game, and it wasn't exactly what I'd hoped for. That's the worst thing in the world! For like an hour, anyway. I soon got over it, and enjoyed Need for Speed 2 for what it was. Besides, how can you hate a game that lets you race as a T-Rex through the Australian Outback? Right, so decades have passed, and it's finally time to review this thing. More specifically, we're going to be looking at Need for Speed 2 Special Edition from here on out. Now, this is really what the game should have been from the start, released only six months after the original in 1997. It's got new cars, new tracks, new race modes, and optional options, and most notably, support for 3D accelerator cards based on chipsets from 3DFX. Namely, the 3DFX Voodoo 1 and the Voodoo Rush. Now, later Voodoo cards largely work as well. You simply need to copy over this executable from the CD-ROM to the installation directory and run that to enable glide mode. Anyway, yeah, onto the game itself. And Need for Speed 2 kicks off with one bonkers introduction with a full motion video intro. Because dang it, it's a 1997 racing game, and that's just what you did. Okay, 
I don't even know if I can convey how amusing this video was to me and my friends back then. We were all little car nuts, so seeing footage of these cars on the open road, we about lost our dadgum minds. And a Tal Design Kala and an XJ220 racing head-to-head, -head, weaving in and out of traffic, I still don't know how they managed this. There were less than 300 XJ220s ever made at over half a million bucks a piece, and the Kala was a one-of-a-kind concept that never made it to production. I know it's all camera tricks and speeding up the footage, but dude, it's still crazy to see. Just imagine the insurance paperwork alone. Then the music ramps up and the cars race faster and faster, soon going supersonic and bursting over the horizon, circling the globe like gas-powered superheroes. <laughs> Perfect! Need for Speed 2! And then that classic menu music starts and... Arr. Gotta admit, a good 63% of my happy NFS2 memories come from that one song. That is some prime Ram de Prisco right there. From here, you're free to choose between single and multiplayer modes, along with opponent catch-up being on or off, functioning as a dynamic handicap. And there are three race types. Single race and tournament, returning from NFS SE, and knockout. A new mode where the last place racer is eliminated after every race. Selecting your location is next, with eight courses from around the world in the special edition here. The marketing and in-game artwork loved touting this international aspect, going for a grand world tour kind of vibe, instead of the vaguely named courses and segmented tracks of the first game. Each course can also be mirrored or played in reverse, a common tactic in the 90s to lazily increase variation. Finally, there's the car selection for both you and your opponents. There are nine licensed cars in the original NFS2 and 12 with SE, with an assortment of pre-made colors to choose from for each car, including black in the special edition. Stupid that you had to get the upgraded version to get such a basic color, but hey, at least I could finally have my black GT90. You can even adjust each car on a technical level, this being the first notable inkling of car tuning in the NFS franchise. Did anyone ever mess with this as a kid? I know I didn't. As for computer opponents, you can race with or without traffic against a single or a seven-car grid, divided into A, B, and C classes. And with that, we're off to the races, with the camera wildly zooming over to the starting line, showing off that fancy new 3D game engine. Three, two, one. All right, let me ask you something. Looking at this footage here, what race mode do you think I'm using? It's got three, simulation, arcade, and wild. In the mode I'm playing here, stuff like this happens, and stuff like this, and even this. Did you guess simulation? Cause yeah, this is NFS2's simulation mode. <laughs> uh, this game. So here's the thing. With the original The Need for Speed, folks were split on either loving or hating its slower pacing. Some saw it as being weighty and realistic. Others saw it as sluggish and boring. So the developers sought to address this in the sequel, with senior programmer Brad Gore stating, With Need for Speed 2, we take certain liberties with the reality of our model to make it feel, rather than look, more realistic. We start with a real model and then tweak it until it feels the way we think it should. Faster, more exciting, without losing touch of the underlying physics. Um, overcorrection much? The physics in NFS2 are a special kind of chaos, regardless of the settings, with a driving model that's about as far removed from NFS1 as possible. Each car is supposed to be unique to drive, but other than acceleration and top speed, they're all about the same in terms of handling. Sitting behind the wheel feels like riding a rocket sled half the time, with pronounced understeer more often than not, and a cartoony physics model that's lost control. Sometimes it's almost believable, other times you're tossing traffic out of the way left and right, making cars tumble end over end down the road like a pair of shoes in the dryer. 
Combined with the often roller coaster esque track design that has you going airborne at the most inopportune moments, and the experience comes across as curiously disconnected. I've been playing NFS2 for nearly a quarter century now, so I'm used to its breed of nonsense, but there are still moments where I can't finish a race unscathed due to the lopsided driving and physics model. Now, did I care much about this as an 11 year old? Nah, not really. If anything, my friends and I had the most fun trying to pull off the stupidest crap possible. The new cinematic cameras in the replay mode made it even better. I don't even know how many hours we spent trying to record the longest jumps and craziest crashes. The inclusion of split screen was a welcome addition for us too, with one of us on the keyboard and the other using a joystick. Ah, good times, man, good times. I still remember wishing that NFS2 wasn't quite so dumb and felt more controllable, but overall I couldn't complain much since it was a great waste of time and had so many cool cars to admire. On that note, the roster of vehicles remains unique to this day with its emphasis on one-off concepts and low production number supercars. In addition to my favorite, the Ford GT90, there's the Ferrari F50. Jaguar XJ220, Itao Design Kala, Lotus Elise GT1, Lotus Esprit V8, Isdera Commendatore 112i, the Ford Indigo, and the fastest road car in the world at the time, the McLaren F1. And that's just the original game. The PC Special Edition added the Itao Design Nazca C2, Ferrari F355 F1, and the Ford Mustang Mach 3. Magazine style car showcases returned too, even without the road and track partnership. Apparently it was cheaper to license cars individually from manufacturers rather than going through the magazine, but whatever, I'm just glad this came back. Complete with more of those radical FMV music videos for every car. Gotta mention the music again, what a soundtrack. From the showcases, to the menus, to the courses themselves, each one has its own couple of songs attached to it, composed by a variety of folks with names that are forever etched into my psyche. Ram DePriesco, Alistair Hurst, Crispin Hands, Jeff Van Dyke, and of course, the late Saki Kaskas, making a return from NFSSE. The soundtrack also happily accentuates each course's visual theme, with tracks based in Norway, Australia, Northern Europe, Canada, Greece, Nepal, USA, and Mexico. NFS2 is also the first in the series with interactive music. If enabled in the options, this splits up the songs into segments, playing different bars at different moments depending on where you are on each track. A nice idea, and one that would be improved in the next game, but I'm not a fan of how it works here because of how it chops up otherwise smoothly flowing songs. It's impressive how much the track complexity evolved as well between the first game and the second, with EA boasting about having 50% more detail than NFS1. Sounds about right to me. They frequently have more varying height and width, way more jumps and ramps to go flying off of, collidable clutter objects on the ground and on the track, and even multiple paths to take through courses. Including parts where you can go off-road, either as a shortcut or simply for fun because it's there. 
Special shout out to the Monolithic Studios course, the most nonsensical track in the game, packed with all kinds of movie and pop culture references from Star Wars to Blade Runner to Jurassic Park. Plus, the most absurd track layout on offer, it's utter wackiness that embraces NFS2's cheese, and I adore it for that. All this track variation helped it feel more dynamic than the first game too, with more potential for each lap to differ from the last. And it was only augmented by the fresh visuals, with a full 3D engine that actually lets you drive in any direction instead of being restricted to a fixed camera. <laughs> it seems like such a needless distinction now, but back then this really was new territory, and it made the world come alive in my preteen imagination. And its effects only added to, uh, the effect, effectively. Tire smoke, dust flying up behind you, bugs splatting against the camera, even rain, snow, and fog, which was a first for the series. Oh yeah, and all that track shading and those shiny cars, that's a thing too in the Special Edition's 3DFX glide mode. Back in the day, I only ever played NFS2 in software mode, so the Special Edition still seems like a luxury to me even now. About the only thing I don't like about it is the fact that the tracks are notably dimmer and less colorful as a result of all the shadows added. It makes the environment look relatively drab. The other drawback is the complete lack of an in-car driver view in 3DFX mode. All you get is a bumper camera, no interior view whatsoever unless you're in software mode. I'm sure there's some technical reason for this, perhaps due to the early Voodoo card's limited frame buffer or how they mixed 2D and 3D imagery, Regardless, the omission is unfortunate. Finally, I've got to mention the bonus content. Because NFS 2SE hails from that golden age of cheat codes and single-player unlockables that I grow to miss more and more as time goes on. If you read the right magazine or found the right fan site online, you'd find a whole list of free codes to type in. There's the standard stuff like unlocking new cars and tracks, which normally happened anyway if you beat the tournament and knockout races. This granted access to the Ford Indigo car and the Monolithic Studios track in the main game, and in Special Edition, you unlock three bonus cars. The Tombstone, FZR 2000, and Bomber BFS. All are fictional vehicles that exist purely for fun and, as a result, can only be used in single race or multiplayer. I honestly forgot these were in the game until making this video. I was always interested in just driving the supercars back then. Actually, that's not entirely true. There was an exception. The traffic and object cheats. Like the stupid T-Rex. <laughs> as if the game wasn't silly enough, NFS2 allows you to race as just about any endgame object. Dinosaurs, outhouses, wooden crates, rocks, covered wagons, logs. Yeah, just logs. All the unmoving decorative items lying around the track, there's a code letting you drive each one of them. And there are codes for traffic vehicles too, so feel free to race as a school bus, a limousine, a Unimog, a 2CV. If it's out on the road, chances are there's a cheat that lets you drive it yourself. Along with cheats to make everything go faster, make cars heavier, and even crash the AI by hitting the horn. And I can't forget the thing where you can drive in reverse honking your horn and smash into objects, which for some reason breaks the physics even more, so you fly off the side of the track over the guardrails. <laughs> uh, just classic 90s racing game silliness. And yep, that's Need for Speed 2. And it is a downright goofy game when compared to its predecessors. I have no problem saying it's actually a little bit crap, especially in relation to the competition in 97 on both PC and consoles. Yeah, the PlayStation version, that's a thing too. It's a great port, all things considered. Really the only port. There was no Sega Saturn version this time, and the announced Panasonic M2 port was cancelled, obviously. But yeah, on the PlayStation in particular, there were so many other great racing games to choose from, and it's little wonder that NFS2 received somewhat middling reviews and a less than enthusiastic response from the rapidly growing Need for Speed fanbase at the time. Its overall absurdity and loose grasp on reality really split people into two camps, those that wanted more realistic racing and those that embraced the dumb. Though it wouldn't be too long before a particularly hot sequel arrived to try and please both groups. And considering this, it makes sense that NFS2 didn't have a huge modding scene making new cars and tracks. 
Not to say it didn't exist at all, there were still a number of custom assets made for the game, but overall modding was limited in scope and short-lived, hardly a blip on the radar compared to what would happen with NFS 3. But that's a topic for another day. For now, I'm happy to enjoy a little taste of late 1997 and all the wonky weirdness that comes with it. And if you enjoyed this episode of LGR, then awesome! I've covered other NFS games in the past, and I'll do more in the future with other retro randomness happening here each week. And as always, thank you for watching.